um, when it's all connected together, it actually communicates across this network. So that if, say, one end of it has more nitrogen, and the other side has more phosphorus, and the other side has more sugar, it can combine all those through this highway of IT. Uh, so they're very integrated systems, and they're, and they're mostly invisible. That, you know, when you're walking outside, you're walking over these networks, but you don't really know they're there. And so that's, that's all I'm gonna say about the basic biology of fungi, now let's turn to the forest. <laughs> So if we, if we want to think of the forest from a, from a fungal perspective, so you're, you're a fungus and you're looking at these trees, what, what does it look like to a fungus? <laughs> <laughs> this is my concept of, what, of what, how the fun, fungi would see the forest. And I see this because wood is roughly 70 to 80% sugar. That's the cellulose and the hemicellulose that's there. It's, it's just sugar. It's not a sugar we could, or it is a sugar we could digest if we could break down those big pieces of it, but we can't. The fungi are exquisitely equipped to break down these long chains of sugar and digest them. So it's, it's a very sugar-rich environment if you're growing in wood, for example. And then if you're connected directly up with a plant, um, the product of photosynthesis is also sugar. And so they're, they're producing, uh, plants are producing a lot of sugar. They tend to have more of it than they need, really. Uh, and what they really need are, are the nutrients that the, that the fungi are very good at finding, things like nitrogen and phosphorus and potassium and all, all the basic nutrients. Okay, so if you're a fungus and you want to have this, get your slice of the cake, there's a number of ways you can do it. One is you can be patient and wait for it to be served to you. And that's, that's what I think of as the, as the uh, saccharose or saccharose, the fungi that uh, degrade uh, plant material that is dead and dying. Um, and then it's, then it's just a piece of cake to it. It's, it's something that they can jump on and, and digest. So we'll go down to the smallest level that this happens on. What you're looking at here is a pop or two pollen grains. So there's the pollen grain. And here is the fungus. Uh, so this is the, the genus Spizellomyces. And if you went up to the Sierras right now, to some, to some alpine lake, and you see this yellow film across the lake, that's all the pine and, and fir pollen that's there. It's just loaded with these fungi. And it's, it's like a dinner bell to these at this time of year. Um, and you never know it unless you looked at it through a microscope, right? So this is very microscopic. So they go after these little parts of plants that they can And also things like leaves. So here is uh, one of our common mushrooms in their coastal forest growing on a, um, a live oak leaf. That's its only substrate. It's very specific. It goes, goes through this and like this is digestive. And uh, if we go to pine needles, we have, we have a different species that goes for the pine needles. Um, and you know, when it's really raining out, if you don't drop pine forest leaves, you those carpets of, of this mycena everywhere. We have some that go after pine cones. This is a harvest alpine uh, growing on a Douglas fir cone. Um, and so all of these are recyclers, right? They're after this uh, dead plant material and they're breaking it down, getting their sugars out, and returning the nutrients to the soil. And then if you go to wood, there's oodles and oodles of fungi that like wood. This is one of our most common uh, fungi on uh, conifer wood. This is the uh, Purple conch or Tricaptum pediatinus, which is uh, everywhere on um, <coughs> sort of year one wood, uh, conifer wood. And the um, equivalent of that on, on leafy trees, hardwoods, uh, would be the uh, <coughs> or, or uh, Chinese bird. So there's, this was a, a 
quick look at some of the staff robes. But the staff robes, I couldn't, we could talk about them for weeks and I couldn't cover them all. There's so many. I mean, they're, it's a very, very diverse group, ecologically uh, uh, diverse group of fungus. Okay. So there's problems with weighting these serves, right? And, and one of those is that there's lots of competition. So when you've got thousands of species out there that are after the same piece of wood, um, you have to have tricks on how you're going to win that competition. Um, and so that, that requires you to either be fast or alternatively be very competitive, be able to push these other ones out as they as they are competing for the same piece of wood. So <clears throat> one way to win this competition is kind of the is kind of the kid's game of dibs, right? You get there first and claim it. Um, and so when fungi do this, they're called endophytes. So what is an endophyte? An, an endophyte is a fungus that colonizes a living plant, but has no uh, outward sign that it's in the plant. Plant's doing fine, couldn't tell it's colonized. The fungus actually doesn't grow very far, it just stops. And then it waits until that, until that plant dies, or that plant part dies, and then it makes its hay. So <clears throat> I'll show you an example of this. So, um, Here's some hail leaves uh, with fungal endophytes in them. And we wouldn't know that on this leaf at all, right? Um, but if you cut out a little piece of this leaf and surface sterilized it with something like bleach or something like that, and then rinse it off and put it on a petri dish, then you can get a fungus to grow out of it. And this is, and this is basically how endophytes were discovered back in the days before the molecular biology now lets you do it more rapidly. But uh, before that, you had to grow these things out. And it, many of them didn't grow very fast or well, but you could get them going. Uh, I got these pictures from this professor, um, uh, Professor Betsy Arnold down in um, Arizona. And she has studied endophytes now her whole career and probably has the largest culture collection of these endophytes. Um, here's some of her favorite ones. <laughs> in fact, she sent me this picture, and the real story behind this picture is that this leaf was, uh, she artificially colonized with seven endophytes. So this one was colonized with an endophyte. And then uh, this leaf was uncolonized by endophytes. And then here and here, she added a pathogen. And so on the uncolonized leaf, the pathogen ro rolls across it and kills part of the leaf. Uh, so the endophytes here actually have a protective function for the, for the plant. And if we were to go out the door here and pick any leaf and do this, surface sterilize it and throw it on the petri dish, we would get fungi out. Because all leaves, almost all leaves, contain endophytes. <laughs> They're, they're just everywhere. Uh, and the truth is we don't know a whole lot about what they do for the plant or if they do anything for the plant because they're so invisible. But we do know that in some cases they can, they can have this protective function. Here's another example of an endophyte. This is a wood endophyte. Here it's behaving like a pathogen or an early saprope. It's decaying this wood and this black covering is what's called a stroma. And if we looked into that stroma, we'd find these little pockets that are producing spores that are going to be shot out here to be colonized. This is the genus hypoxylon. But what goes on with those spores is that they have uh, kind of a, a clear covering on them with a little slit on them. And for years, nobody knew what the function of this was. But then uh, um, Nasser Chapella found that if you took these spores and put them on their, on the uh, bark of their host tree, they would split open and germinate within seconds. So they would, they could 
chemically detect that they were on the right bark. And then what they would do is they'd grow into the wood and stop growing and just wait. So they were a, a wood endophyte. And then uh, when the wood starts to become um, stressed, especially by water, then they activate again and start to grow and become pathogenic. So they, they're sort of like the, uh, they're waiting uh, for that condition under which they can be a good pathogen. But they start off like as an endoplasm. Here is a local example of that same thing related to the hypoxylon. Some of you have probably seen this. It's called, uh, the common name is this cramp balls, and you find it on uh, uh, coastal live oak, especially. People see this? If you, if you go out now in, in, in Tilden Park or any place where there's lots of live oak and look on dead branches, you'll see this thing. But it, it too starts as an endophyte and then takes over that wood uh, when it's stressed. And um, it interacts with another disease that I'll come to later, um, but it, it's super common. And then <clears throat> if you go up in the Sierras, uh, there's the Indian paint fungus. This this big clump that when you break it open has this rosy inside, uh, kind of orangey inside that you can use to uh, uh, paint your skin with. Um, it's it's a very aggressive uh, heart lot of trees, but it can't colonize the outer wood, the sapwood, uh, when the tree is intact. So how does it get in the heartwood? The way it gets in there is it colonizes branch stubs at a very young age and then and then becomes an endophyte. It goes quiescent until that branch stub is grown over by the by the trunk of the tree and becomes incorporated in the heartwood. And at that point it can be a heart rock and, and, and yet other uh kind of lots of trees. So a very patient fungus it can uh, be there for decades before it becomes active. But then once it is active, it can take right off. Okay, let's turn back to the cave. So <clears throat> the problem with being an endophyte, of course, is just that you, you have to wait a long time. So um, how about a different strategy? Why don't we just grab as much of this cake as we can take and take more as soon as we can get it? That's, that's what a pathogen's about. The real go get on pathogens, they don't have to wait for the, the piece of wood to die or go dysfunctional or the leaf to drop. They can just uh, go after it. Uh, um, now, this is basically greedy. It seems like such a great strategy. Why aren't all fun duck pathogens? <laughs> you know? And the reason is that trees are not cakes, that they defend themselves, right? That, that uh, when, when most fungi land on a plant, the plant is aware of that almost immediately and, and starts to, to gear up a, a, a response to that that'll shut down the fungal infection. So unless the pathogen is well attuned to that particular plant genotype, it's not going. It's not going to be able to colonize it. So pathogens are a rare lot. Uh, you wouldn't know they're rare because there's many of them, but relative to most fungi, uh, they're a rare lot. <clears throat> this, but what this means is that if you're a successful pathogen, you're leaving behind a lot of competition. Mostly what you need to be a successful pathogen is this interaction with your host. So you can overcome that, the host defenses. So I'm going to walk you through a couple of the pathogens in forests and show you how, okay, they kill trees and tree parts and so on, but they also have sort of a creative role in, in uh, sculpting the way our forests look. And the first example of that, I'm going to, the first example of that I'm going to give you are things that attack the upper parts of trees, especially the leaves and needles. So what we're looking at here is a needle disease that's on moderate pine. And this is um, red band needle disease. 
and you're looking at an infection of moderate kind up in Mendocino County. Now what's interesting about this is that this pathogen is anywhere you can get moderate kind. It's all over the place. But it really only has a big impact when moderate pine is planted outside its natural range. So on the Monterey Peninsula, you can find this disease, but it has very little impact. But when you plant Monterey pine up in Mendocino County, this pathogen will wipe it out. You basically cannot grow Monterey pine up in Mendocino County. Uh, and this was learned because they planted big plantations of it for Christmas trees. And, and it didn't work because of, because of this native pathogen. So here's a, a further picture of that Christmas tree plantation. You can see this nice green tree in the foreground. Uh, that's Douglas fir. <laughs> so it's a non-host for this pathogen. Uh, but all of the Monterey pine is dead. Um, so this is actually fairly typical of native pathogens, is that they often have a, a bigger impact in part, some parts of the range than others. And in this case, it probably defines the range of Monterey pine. That when you move Monterey pine off its range, this will kill it. And as long as it's in, in this coastal, southern coastal area, it does quite well. So a close relative of this is brown spot needle blight, and I thought I'd show you the microscopics on this. So here's the little spore. Here's the hypha germinating. It's just growing right down into the, the little stony on the needle surface. So that's how it gets into these needles. And then uh, it will form these little creep bodies on there. It'll produce more spores, and then the needles all go brown and spiny and are producing all the spores. So brown spot needle blight, Blight is a problem mostly in the eastern U.S., especially the southeastern U.S. It has a very interesting interaction with longleaf pine. And the interaction with longleaf pine is that when it's when longleaf pine first starts off, this needle cast uh, will be on those those dense leaves. And when it's growing in sort of a fieldy area, the microclimate with all the grass around stuff keeps it very moist and is very conducive to infection. And so these little trees uh, kind of tolerate the disease, but they don't grow very well. And so they can sit around for a decade in what's called a grass stage, where the tree will get about this big and not go anywhere. And then, if you have a fire that runs through this grass stage, it'll burn off the, uh, off the needles, uh, destroying all the, the fungal spores, uh, and the, the bud of this is fire resistant and will survive through it, and then it will produce new needles which are uninfected. In the next few years, it just bolts and then becomes a, a big tree. And the, the way that it was discovered that, that uh, the foresters knew about this for a long time, that the longleaf pine sat in this grass stage and wouldn't grow. And it was a big problem because it's not what you want 10 years of no growth in California, right? Um, and so they knew that there was this fire interaction, but they didn't know it was correlated with this fungus. But then the experiment was done where you just use fungicides on the same thing without the fire, and you can also get it to bolt. So it's, it's just the suppression of growth by this pathogen that keeps it down in this grass stage. But, it, but it's sort of incorporated into the natural fire cycle associated with long leaf pine. And another example of one of these above ground pathogens that has a sort of range determining effect is the Texas canker. If you've been down to the Berkeley Marina, uh, especially on the Kite Park side, the um, uh, Cesar Chavez side, uh, there's a whole bunch of, of cypress that. Uh, has lost branches and looks like crap, and you'll find um, stumps where they've cut them out completely because they've been killed. And it's all due to this uh, cypress canker. If you look at one of these branches that's just turning red here and dying, it'll look like this with this dripping pitch. And if you look more closely at it, you'll see these little fruit bodies 
right on the uh, bark. And then if you uh, scrape these and put them on a microscope, they get these beautiful little spores. Um, but cypress canker is another one of these diseases that's native uh, and has a huge impact when the, when the trees are off their normal site. So when this, uh, our native cypresses are all very uh, small endemics. They have little areas where they grow well um, and then uh, many areas where they don't. And this pathogen is one of the reasons that's true, that as soon as you move it off range, and this isn't off range very much, I mean, like would be native to Monterey, for example. Um, when you move it off range, the pathogen has a big impact on it. And this is one of my favorite fungal diseases, mostly because it, it doesn't look like a fungal disease. It looks like mud or something taking this. This is the uh, felt like or purple trichium. And uh, if we blow this up closely, doesn't that look just like it's been plastered with mud? But, but this is all fungus that's wrapping the thing up. And um, this only grows under the snow. So you find this at high altitude in the, in, uh, the Western mountains in particular. Um, and the snow actually has to be, uh, the only time it can grow is when the snow is isotonic meaning that it's at zero degrees. So it's, it's in equilibrium with water. So there's just a, you know, a few weeks in the spring where it, that's perfect. And, and it only works well when, the, when there's a, a big pile of snow. If you don't have enough of it, it doesn't last there long enough, you don't get this growth, and there's no pathogenic effect. So the place to see this in the Sierras is along roads, because the plowing makes artificially big piles of snow right along the mountains, or in tree lines. So when you go up to tree line, uh, then you get big piles of snow that last, especially in years like this year, uh, that last uh, for weeks or months. Um, and what happens there is that the trees themselves, when you get these little uh, crumpholtz trees, uh, they tend to collect snow. Um, and so as the, as the little tree island gets bigger, it collects more snow, and the pathogen becomes more effective <laughs> and trims the thing back. <laughs> so you, it kind of regulates tree island size when you get up to the, when you get up to the um, edge of where trees can grow. Okay, now let's turn to, to fungal diseases that are below ground. <laughs> and attack the roots. And we'll stay in the Sierras initially uh, and we'll look at Yosemite Valley. So here we're, we're in Yosemite Valley and you can see all these dead trees here. And if we went to the edge of this, what you'd see um, is uh, you know, a normal healthy looking tree, a normal healthy looking tree that's slightly shorter a tree that doesn't look quite healthy, and that's how, it's, how the uh, foliage is kind of open, and then a uh, dead tree. And, it, and if we put this in three dimensions, it'd be sort of a little circular area where this kind of arrangement would be the edge of that circle. <coughs> so this is what's called a root disease center. And what's happening is the pathogen is growing out across from root to root to root. And, and expanding uh, the area in which it's killing these trees. This can have uh, a big impact. <laughs> and this, this was um, maybe a couple of decades ago up in uh, Yosemite Village. Um, they had a big root disease problem there, still do. Um, but the uh, ponderosa pines were the tree that was susceptible to it. And when windstorms would come, they'd have to evacuate a lot of the campgrounds and the Yosemite village because of this pathogen. Uh, because the trees would be still living, but they wouldn't have much in the way of roots anymore. So this, this disease is, is uh, uh, 
facilitated by humans. But what happens is it, it colonizes freshly cut stumps. So every time uh, they would build a road or put in cabins or something like that and make a stump, the, the spores from this pathogen would, would uh, colonize the stump and then grow down that root into the next tree over, which is a good living tree, and start working on that, and then go down the next tree, and the next tree, and the next tree, and expand. So let me show you what that did in Yosemite. So here's the circles of, of the identifiable root disease in 1972. And by 1997, it covered uh, you know, they expanded out and sort of coalesced into one big root decay center. Mm -hmm. This is sort of near El Capitan. Mm -hmm. And this would be the Yosemite village area. You can see how much more open it is now. Uh, and that's because partly they've removed a lot of these trees to, to reduce the dangers. And what, it, what the trees are now in this area are oaks. Mm -hmm. And oak is immune to this particular disease, or, or tolerant of it, I would say. Um, and so this, this is kind of sculpting the, the composition of the forest, right? That it's, it's removing the most susceptible oaks, especially as they become very dense, and there's a lot of root continuity there. Um, and it's changing it back to an oak forest, which is what it was before fire suppression. <laughs> so, it, so it's interesting how the fungal patches interact uh, with the composition. Another one that does that is the genus Armillaria, the honey mushroom. And as gardeners, you may have run into Armillaria uh, because it, it doesn't just stay on trees. It can do things like roses and like that sometimes. And it's probably on every uh, coastal live oak out there. That they sort of fight it to expand still. Um, but harbor. This is its relative up north uh, that causes a, a, a much bigger problem. If you strip away the bark from a dead tree, you'll get these mycelial fans that you can find. And that's one of the signs that it's the honey mushroom vineyard. And also these big black rhizomorphs that are below the bark. But here's the aerial view of it. And you can see these little spots in the forest. Wow. That are caused by the uh, by the root disease, the armillary root disease, and the reason you can see them is that it's changed the composition of that forest. That it's taken out the susceptible host, and those have been replaced by species that are less susceptible to that disease. And so you can see the color change as a result of that. And this, if you heard about the humongous fungus a few years ago, yeah, yeah. it covered um, what was it, 40 acres up in northern Michigan. That was honey mushroom. And then the, um, the foresters up in uh, Oregon uh, had to do them one better, and they found that the, their honey mushroom could cover over a square mile of woods. And that was just a single individual that had spread out mm -hmm. through this, through this um, web of mycelium. Okay, so what I just showed you were a bunch of examples of native pathogens that have these complex interactions with, with forests. They can change the composition, they can uh, take out stressed trees, uh, they can define the ranges of trees, uh, that sort of thing. But then there's a second set of pathogens that are introduced forest pathogens, and these are a whole other game. So what I'm talking about here are when pathogens are moved by us across continents. And the, the poster child for this is uh, chestnut fly, which was moved in uh, around the uh, end of the 20th century into the Bronx Zoo, actually. And then in, in 40 years, it cut across the whole eastern US and uh, eliminated an estimated 4 billion chestnut trees. Chestnut, chestnut was, uh, prior to this disease, uh, one in four trees in the eastern deciduous forest was a chestnut. 
And after the, the uh, disease went through, there were no uh, canopy level chestnuts. You could have killed them to the ground and those stumps sprout. So you've got sort of small little chestnuts, but uh, they don't mature anymore. And it's basically eliminating what was a dominant tree species. How did it do this? Well, it did this because the chestnut was what we would call a naive pathogen. It had never seen this disease before, so it had no um, genetics to kind of counter it. Kind of, kind of like us in COVID. <laughs> you know, in Although we have a more adaptive immune system, so we, so we eventually come to terms with it, whereas these trees have not. Another example closer to home of an introduced pathogen is a, a pitch canker, which attacks Monterey pine. This was a picture of a Monterey pine uh, uh, in Ohlone Park in Berkeley uh, a few years ago. And you can see all the tips look like they're dying. If you look up close, uh, it's usually near cone whorls that it starts and there's a lot of pitch involved. This is caused by a uh, fungus called Fusarium that makes these really attractive uh, spores. But it has a, a real devastating effect on monitor pine and bishop pine. This is uh, pitch chamber trees and bishop pine in uh, Point Reyes National Seashore. Uh, if you've been down around Minotaur Road, uh, you'll see a lot of this. Uh, all the dead trees there are this disease. Um, this is one where we don't know where it came from yet, but it's suspected of coming from Mexico. Um, but it sh actually showed up in the southeastern U.S. in about the 40s or something, and then only got here in about the 70s. You can stay in Point Reyes and look at another introduced pathogen. This is sudden oak death. What you're looking at here are all dead tan oaks. Um, this is a disease that was brought in by the nursery industry, uh, and especially moving uh, rhododendrons around. It has brought this disease all over the place. Uh, it has a huge host range. Uh, it's killed whole hillsides of, of live oak and, and uh, tan oak, especially uh, down in the Big Sur area, um, and is an ongoing problem. We should be bad this year, I would guess, because it, it doesn't, uh, most of its infections occur in years where you get kind of cool, wet springs, which is what we've got this year. And then you see all the death about two years after that. <laughs> yeah, no, they're growing like crazy now, but cool, it, it sporulates in the spring. And so unless it's really wet, it doesn't do it very effectively. But when you get a lot of moisture in the spring, then it's very effective at colonizing new world. Even though they think they're doing well. <laughs> okay, so here's our list of ways to get your cake. The one we haven't talked about is mutualisms. How do you deal with a baker? <laughs> you know, why sell for one cake? You can have many bakes if you deliver something to them as well. So that something is a symbiosis called mycorrhizae, and in forests, the common type of mycorrhizae is ectomycorrhizae. And what goes on in this uh, is a basic commodity exchange where the tree is giving sugars to the fungus directly uh, in an interaction on the root tips. So the root tips are kind of swollen and colonized with this fungus, but not killed by the fungus. It's just interacting with it. And at that interface, it's getting sugars from the host tree, and it's giving nutrients to the tree, especially nitrogen that it scavenges in the, in the soil um, and litter back to the host. Now, it's an obligate association where the trees basically can't live without it. Uh, and we know this because if you take pines, for example, and move them to an area where pines never existed, they don't grow. They'll grow about this big and stop. Uh, that experiment was done in the 50s in Puerto Rico originally. Uh, and that was a Caribbean pine that grew in, on the adjacent island of Hispaniola. 
um, very well, but in Puerto Rico they wouldn't grow. And it wasn't until they brought in Michael Eisen that they started to grow. And the same thing is happening now in the southern hemisphere, but um, maybe not a, a great interaction where pines there initially didn't grow. They brought in mycorrhizae, they grew. Now pines are invasive. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so, like in, um, if you go down to uh, the southern end of Argentina and Chile and go up in the Andes there, uh, our lodgepole pine is hugely invasive there. Uh, and if you go to S South Africa, Monterey pine and some of the other pines also are, are invasive in South Africa now. And it's all because we brought the mycorrhizae to them that allowed them to become invasive. Before that, they, they couldn't be. So this is what this interaction looks like in a greenhouse setting. So here's a little bishop pine. This is um, the fruit body of Picaria. And these are the colonized roots. If we blow these roots up, you can see some little fuzz around it, which is the fungus. If you cut them in half, there's a wrapper of fungus that goes around it. And then the fungus goes between the, the root cells, but it doesn't penetrate. And if you went and dug up uh, soil around some other pine forest, you'd find many different looking mycorrhizae. And that's because the diversity of these is huge. There's probably over 10,000 species of fungi that form ectomycorrhizal interactions. Um, and so most of the diversity, when you walk into a pine forest, or a Douglas fir forest, or an oak forest, most of the diversity of mushrooms that you find on the ground are all these mycorrhizal mushrooms. And there's saccharides there too, but they're the little ones usually, where the, the mycorrhizal mushrooms can be Huge, sometimes in a very pleasant way. <laughs> it's our edible, but we just edible. Wow. Uh, and uh, Matsutake is another edible mycorrhizal mushroom. And the chanterelle is another edible mycorrhizal mushroom. And uh, um, all the rushalots. Um, and the, most of the coral fungi. And the milk mushroom. And, and Cortinaria is a huge, huge genus with, last time I looked, over a thousand species. Um, it's all mycorrhizal. And the uh, hydrophorus are all mycorrhizal. And the ammonitas are almost all mycorrhizal. in this case. <laughs> this one's always a, the poster child for poisonous mushrooms, right? But it turns out you can, you can detoxify this one. It can be parboiled and then eaten. Uh, I was very skeptical about this, but it's kind of force fed by someone else. Someone else. Uh, uh, and the inosophy, yeah, I wouldn't hear <laughs> And the inosophy, these little brown mushrooms that are all over forest floor. And the, and the deep lumens. And on and on and on. And on. <coughs> I haven't even showed you the, the more cryptic ones. <laughs> but, but the take home message here is huge diversity associated with these ectomycorrhizal things. It's uh, when you go to a pine forest, it looks amazingly boring above ground. You know, one, <laughs> one plant species, very little understory. In the soil, the diversity is like the tropics. You know, it's like hundreds of species under a small pine canopy. So <clears throat> this is the way that interaction can look uh, with a seedling. So this is all mycelium of, of uh, a Sewilla species growing out. The roots here are just this little bit here. So you can see there's a, there's a lot of biomass that's all being driven by these few needles up here. Wow. Um, so they, they're getting a lot of sugar. <laughs> And people try to quantify this. This is a, um, you know, a birch seedling, and they've given it radioactive uh, uh, CO2, and then used um, RAI to, to look at this in real time. And you can see that, the, that most of the, the labeled CO2 uh, go 
goes right to the edge of the mycelium. So this is all the sugars that are being shipped out to this fungus. And little seedlings like this are, are giving typically over half of what they produce to these fungi. Uh, it scales down a little bit, we think, as trees get bigger, like it might be like only 20%. So it's a huge tax, basically, on these trees. But this is the best argument I can think of for tax. Because these trees can't grow without it. <laughs> so it's, it's like giving them the ability to do things they couldn't do otherwise, even though it costs them a lot. So you can think if you scale this up to a forest, you know, it's got to be a lot of carbon. <laughs> <laughs> this is um, this is Bolita's Photoshopping eye. <laughs> In its, uh, in its native habitat, the uh, digital photo. <laughs> All right. So, so we're talking about this mutualism, but really, this even mycorrhizae is a whole continuum. That okay, you can be out on this mutualistic end where both plant and fungus are benefiting, and sometimes you can be in this middle zone where neither one is getting a whole lot. But you can also, this can turn into parasitism as well. And I'll show you examples of this both on the plant side and the fungal side. So the plant side first, because it's maybe more attractive, is uh, <clears throat> pine drops. How many of you have seen pine drops up in the Sierras? Really, I'm shocked. You guys not get to the Sierras. This is, this is a super common thing. Um, but it's a, it's a relative of, of our uh, um, Arctostaphylus, um, but it has no chlorophyll. And it just makes this, this bright red uh, flowering feedstock. And the way it does that is if you go down below ground, it's got this big root ball that's all densely mycorrhizal roots. And the fungus that's on that is also on the surrounding pines. So it's getting sugar from the pine through the fungus. And as far as we know, it gives the fungus nothing that it really needs. So it somehow faked out this fungus and you're reversing the direction of, of sugar flow. It's, it's taking sugar from the fungus where plants usually give sugars to the fungus. Um, and here's its relative sarcodes. And this tree is a fungal tree. Uh, a little piece of a fungal tree of one genus of fungus. And what it's shown here is that both of these are highly specific. They're going after one little species group of a, of a truffle-like fungus called rhizopogon. And even within that, they split who, who goes after which one. Um, so like parasites worldwide, uh, there's a lot of specificity here. In this, in this case, um, where they target a particular uh, fungal mycorrhizal species in this whole sea of, of many. And if we go to the whole family of, uh, of these non photosynthetic mycorrhizal parasites, each one picks out a different fungus and is specific on them. And so some of the really rare ones uh, have, are rare probably because they picked very rare fungi. <laughs> so they're not, uh, they, have, they haven't picked something widespread that allows them to be all over the place. And let's go to the parasitism on the other side of, of the microbial association where the fungus is parasitic. And I'll, I'll turn to the, um, the edible truffle. Uh, the um, truffle melanosporum here, which <clears throat> is hunted with pigs that can sniff it out. It's associated with oaks. This is in probably in France where this picture is. And you can also see it though because around the oaks that are colonized by the truffle, the grass is all dead and looks like it's mowed. It's called a mule. And what's going on there is the truffle that is mutualistic with the oak is parasitic on the grass roots. 
So I always think of this as a, as a really interesting symbiosis that kind of models itself after the mafia. <laughs> that the, the host tree has hired the truffle to wipe out its competition. <laughs> and, that's, and that's why you get these rules. So, I have to say that all fungi are not answer. Hey, someone me. <laughs> and uh, the poster child for this are the nematode trapping fungi. There are a whole bunch of fungi that trap nematodes, tiny, these tiny little microscopic worms that are everywhere. Um, and they do it with crazy systems. Some have these little uh, poison droplets that, uh, that'll kill them, or sticky droplets that'll move them. I'll show you that in a, in a second here with a slightly different invertebrate. And then various nets and nooses. This is a, my favorite example of this, where they have these constricting uh, traps, where the nematode will stick its head through here, and then the thing cinches down on it, instantly and grab them and then uh, grows into them and kills them and, and digests them. Um, and I have to say, when I was first taking uh, mycology as an undergraduate and heard about these things, I was fascinated by assumed they were kind of rare little oddities that ended up in courses like that, but weren't very common. But then a few years ago, a fellow in Davis uh, surveyed them in soil to see how common they were. And he couldn't find a gram of soil that didn't contain them. <laughs> so they are they are out all over the place eating up nematodes. Why do they do that? There's lots of other foods. Well, the nematodes, unlike a lot of um, uh, plant debris, is very rich in nitrogen. They've got uh, instead of being stuffed with um, cellulose. They're made up mostly of proteins, which have a lot of nitrogen in them. And so in environments, especially where there isn't a lot of nitrogen, these can be really, really common. Okay, and then I have to show you this example. This is a, one that we had in, in a class at Berkeley, which shows the students. And one of the students shot this video, actually. And what you're looking at here is the fungus zoophagus. And it's got these little pegs off to the side, and little hyphae that don't go anywhere. And this poor rotifer thought it was going to eat the fungus, but as soon as it got around it, it got super glued onto its fungus <laughs> by the fungus. And then it's stuck there, and the fungus grows into it and kills it. Um, and so this is an example of a stick trap that uh, some of some of the stick traps are also used against nematodes. And then, of course, bacteria are super numerous and a great source of food. And, and uh, so fungi uh, key in on those, too. So what you're looking at here are little um, colonies of bacteria, and the fungus grows toward them and then, and then uh, lyses them. So in the end, you just get fungus left, and the bacteria are now gone. <laughs> Um, and, and so there's this dynamic interaction going on, and there's bacteria that will flip that and go after the fungus, too. But all of this is happening in the soil all the time. But also in wood. It, it turned out that this, these photos came from a paper that showed that a lot of the wood decay fungi actually have the ability to hone in on bacteria and and pack those as well as decay wood. And the reason they do that again is that wood is a very, is kind of a junk food diet, very sugar rich, but not with a lot of uh, nitrogen in particular, where bacteria are going to be rich in nitrogen and so they can supplement the diet. So have these any fungi you would know? Yes. The oyster mushroom, which you can get in Safeway now. <laughs> um, is a wood rotter, that's how we grow it, but it also is a nematode trapper. It's got these little uh, poison pill nematode traps. 
and it's also a bacteria board. So a lot of these can do multiple things, and uh, this being a good example. And in terms of animals, we can go up the scale here to larger animals, and you might have heard of white-nosed bat syndrome, which is a fun little disease. And this is a this is a good example of an introduced pathogen again. This one apparently came from Europe. Um, and it has been sweeping across the continent here now and exterminating large numbers of bats. Um, this is a fungus actually growing on bat nose here, so it's going to make hibernate. And having really similar effects to introduce uh, plant pathogens, but, but in a bat population. And another good example of this is the amphibian decline, which is caused by uh, a fungus and it's been moved around by the bullfrog trade and is now worldwide and has caused extermination of a number of endangered uh, frogs and birds. This is a close-up of a frog skin and these little pustules here are the fruit bodies of the, of the citrus fungus. Basically, the, the two are always together, and they are interacting in, in a whole variety of ways. So when you, with all trees? With all trees, yeah. But not always with mycorrhizae. Uh -huh. But they, they have the pathogens, and they have the endophytes, and that whole range of interactions, and, and the saprobes are breaking down when they talk about it. They're actually all mycorrhizal. I looked through a bit, but they're not all actually mycorrhizal. So they wouldn't necessarily be associated with these big mushrooms. But logical pine bush, which is what I'm showing. So if you walk through a logical pine forest, or say a mixed hardwood forest in the Lake States, or even a gypsum hard forest in Borneo, or a eucalyptus forest in uh, Australia, any place like that, uh, fungi are a integral part of these systems. So anytime you're in a forest, you know, I want you to think that what you're walking by are not just trees, but they're all these diverse formal interactions that are going on. In an orchard, there are certainly diverse formal interactions, which is uh, oftentimes to the detriment of the orchard, <laughs> that there are these many of these pathogens. Um, but there would also be mycorrhizal interactions there, but, it, but again, a different type of mycorrhizae that I've not explained. And with that, I will stop and open up to questions, and I'm happy to answer. So um, the first question was about the nematode trapping fungi, whether they've been used for sort of biocontrol. Uh, people have been trying to do that for ages. I think the most success on it was, was a fellow down in uh, Riverside who's developed it for a particular nematode disease, which I've forgotten now which one it is. But he's selected a fungus that goes after the nematode eggs, and it, uh, it shows uh, good effect on reducing the severity of this medical disease. Which, um, your second question was about pollen and uh, water. What I didn't tell you when I gave that example was that these are all aquatic fungi. And I, I gave the example of them being on the lake surface and you see the pollen. That's what you see. Uh, and <clears throat> when it hits the ground, it's covering these little um, vernal pools that you know, exist for a short time, enough for the swimming spores, in this case, to find the pollen. What is it, I've, I've read a whole bunch of these books about the fungi, and of course, it's great, but how about our ordinary 
not tree kind of plants that we have. Are fungi a part of their life at all? Yes. So, <clears throat> again, all plants are going to have these pathogens of various sorts. There's going to, there's every, every plant has a fungal pathogen, more than one, many, uh, which you, as gardeners, you know. Um, and then uh, there will all be uh, saccharomic fungi that break them down once they're dead. But they also have this mycorrhizal interaction, but just a different mycorrhizal interaction. And most garden plants have a type of mycorrhizal interaction that never produces a mushroom or any kind yeah. of above ground anything. It's all microscopic and below ground. And they produce very large spores that are soil borne. Uh, and uh, the, the estimates are that uh, over 90% of plant families are obligately mycorrhizal uh, of either this ectos type that are in these temperate forests I mentioned or of the uh, other type which used to be called endo and it's now called, um, we call it chlamelium now, um, that you wouldn't see any outward signs of. Mm -hmm. you have to, they, 